Welcome back in Cardio Minds to Cardiac Delusions. Let's see our code today. Don't give IV flows to a shocked patient as it may be a cardiogenic shock. Is that true or false? We have a 70 year old male patient who presented to the ER by confusion and deadliness of two days duration. His blood pressure was 70 over 40 and heart rate 130. Peripheral pulsation not felt with cold extremities and no urine output for one day. His son mentions that he has long standing history of ischemic LV systolic dysfunction with multiple PCI procedure and last echo two months ago showed an injection fraction of 30% with a kinetic hole LED territory. So he was admitted to the ICU with a provisional diagnosis of cardiogenic shock based on this history. And just before starting IV enotrope, one of the ICU doctors started 500 ml saline drip over about 30 minutes. This resulted in rise of blood pressure to 90 over 60 with felt peripheral pulsation and the infusion continued guided by the CVP monitoring using central line with improvement of urine outputs and the extremities got warm after two hours. So actually it was a hypovolemic shock rather than cardiogenic shock. When the ICU doctor asked his son about much more clinical details, he mentioned that his diuretic regimen was increased by his physician based on this prescription, and this was about five days ago, and he admitted that his dad has poor water intake during the last few days, so he had overdiuresis and also decreased water intake resulting in hypovolemic shock. So the question now, was this practice of a flow challenge beneficial? or it was just a coincidence and so it should not be used routinely. First of all, what is the clinical definition of shock? It is a clinical state of organ hyperperfusion caused by reduced systemic blood pressure. So it describes the state of hyperperfusion whatever the cause. The most famous cause is hypovolemic shock which can be caused by hemorrhage or dehydration either due to decreased fluid intake or increased fluid loss. It can be cardiogenic shock due to structural heart disease, acute myocardial infarction either due to pump failure or mechanical complication, tachy or bradyarrhythmias. arrhythmias. It can be distributive shock due to the decreased systemic vascular resistance as in septic shock or anaphylactic shock. And it can be obstructive shock like in high risk pulmonary embolism or tamponade. We need to remind ourselves that it is not enough to have reduced arterial blood pressure to diagnose shock because a patient may be hypotensive but he is not shocked. We need to have oliguria due to renal hyperperfusion, poorly felt or unfelt peripheral pulsation, cold extremities in the majority of cases but they may be warm in distributive shock and prolonged capillary refilling time. And what are the labs that may be helpful to confirm diagnosis? The increased serum lactate level due to anaerobic glycolysis and increased hematocrit level more than three times the hemoglobin which may be suggesting of hemoconcentration due to dehydration. In order to reach the cause we need to have targeted history taking from the patient but not always applicable if the patient is confused. So at the time we may take history from the relatives or witness in order to reach the cause. We need to have a quick clinical examination and then to have targeted specific investigations that help to reach the cause. So we need to ask about history of bleeding, history of fluid loss or reduced fluid intake because one of these features may suggest hypovolemic shock. We need to ask about history of heart disease, cardiac symptoms, lower limb edema, which may be suggestive of cardiogenic shock. We need to ask about history of fever or exposure to source of infection or symptoms or signs of localizing infection, which may suggest septic shock. And we need to ask about recent drug or food intake, past or family history of allergies, which may suggest anaphylactic shock. We can ask about risk factors for venous thromboembolism like recent surgery, immobilization, pregnancy or recent delivery, lower limb pain, swelling, redness or hotness which may suggest lower limb DVT, dyspnea, chest pain or syncope, all of these may suggest pulmonary embolism as a cause of obstructive shock, predisposing disease for pericardial effusion like lupus, malignancy or uremia which may suggest tamponade. To have a quick and targeted examination we need to examine two check to, sculptate to and exclude one thing.
The examination for neck veins in order to exclude congested neck veins and cardiogenic or obstructive shock and examining lower limbs for edema or signs of DVT. Checking two is checking the pulse for tachy or bradyarrhythmia and checking temperature for septic shock. Auscultate two, auscultate the heart for murmurs or gallop rhythm and auscultate the chest for fine basic crepitations, wheezes or coarse crepitations like in pneumonia and exclude pulsus paradoxus which may suggest tamponade or pulmonary embolism in high risk cases. And the urgent investigation to order in this case are the ECG, arterial blood gas, complete blood picture and kidney function test. So that was the resume about the approach to a shocked patient. What about any life-saving measures that I can do in order to rescue this patient? We can have a flow challenge of 500 to 100 milliliter normal saline, oxygen mask to improve oxygen delivery to the tissues, and ICU admission of course, whatever you have reached the cause or not, for close monitoring of blood pressure, starting IV support, ECG monitoring, and mechanical ventilation in case of coexisting respiratory failure. But the flow challenge may raise a concern in some doctors about the possibility that the patient may be having cardiogenic shock. So what about this issue? Regarding the flow challenge, if the patient is having hypovolemic shock or septic shock, it can result in partial clinical improvement till you treat the reversible cause and start appropriate treatments. But in cardiogenic shock, does it result in improvement or not? We need to emphasize that the flow challenge will not worsen a patient with cardiogenic shock or for example, precipitate acute pulmonary edema. However, sometimes it may improve the hemodynamics if the patient is combined to have cardiogenic shock with volume depletion, for example, due to overdiuresis, which is common in cardiac patients. So we can consider the flow challenge to be like a diagnostic test that if the patient had clinical improvement, I may suspect hypovolemic or septic shock, but if there is no clinical improvement, I may suspect cardiogenic or obstructive shock. But before emphasizing this issue, we need to ask ourselves, when can the flow challenge be hazardous in patients with cardiogenic shock? If you are infusing more than 100 milliliter saline or using a colloid transfusion like Hestril or packed RBCs, in this case, it may result in RV volume overload, which can result in septal bulge towards the left ventricle, resulting in impaired LV diastolic filling and increased pulmonary venous congestion and, of course, reduce LV forward flow, so it may precipitate acute pulmonary edema and sometimes it may worsen the shocked state, so in this case, flow challenge is dangerous and so you should adhere to the first line of 500 to 1000 milliliter normal saline. So this famous quote is not accurate and so flow challenge is one of the essential resuscitative measures in any shocked patient and it can be considered as a diagnostic test as it can make partial improvement in hypovolemic and septic shock and it will not worsen cardiogenic shock provided that you avoid too much volumes and you avoid colloid transfusion. Thank you very much for watching this video and wait next week for the next delusion.